My Joy Punk podcast guest today is Cyrilda Summers McGee. She is the principal and chief human resources officer for Workplace Change, a culturally progressive human resource firm that creates measurable change in America's workplaces. She is a national speaker and author of the book, Change the Work Game, Building and Sustaining a Diverse Workforce. Prior to this, Cyrilda was the chief human resources officer for the city of Portland. Sorilda has worked with PGE, Providence Health, Wyden and Kennedy, Miller Nash, Oregon Health and Science University, Northwest Natural, ODOT, Metro, Reed College, University of Oregon, Port of Portland, the Portland Trailblazers, the City of Portland, Portland Business Alliance, and Kaiser Permanente, and my friends at Marmoset Music, Modernist Financial, and E-Roy to help them determine strategies to recruit, retain, and support top talent from all backgrounds. Sorilda's philosophy is that leaders are charged with the responsibility of establishing or maintaining company cultures that accepts people for whom they are. Transparency informs staff about company policies and processes, holds staff accountable for their work, and empowers them to be the best versions of themselves. When leaders do this, companies thrive. This is joy punk to me. Cyrilda, welcome. Hey, girl. Hey. Hi. <laughs> it is so fun to have you here today. Happy to be here with you. Mm. I was meditating earlier this week on having you here at the podcast, and I realized that we would be recording on the full moon. And it made me smile because you are a person in my life who is not afraid to shine a light on what we keep in the dark. Right on. Thank you. Also, I have so much respect and trust in you because I know you're going to tell me what you think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have found that that was is been one of the like most challenging things for me in relationships and friendships with people when they withhold from me because I am someone I just I mean like I put my foot in it all the time. Mm -hmm. I trespass. And I don't think that's necessarily because I'm unthoughtful or unkind. It's, it's cause, I think it's because I'm human, but I simply yearn to be known and express myself. And in that action, there seems to be um, so much room as a human to be misunderstood. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's, uh, just, um, and so I find myself seeking friendships or relationships or coming back for folks that where I trust that we can have conflict because I really feel like conflict's a true sign mm -hmm. of intimacy. Yes. I would love to see people get better at that. I mean, I love when like, I just love that for you and I, that we can like rub up against each other. We can disagree on things. Absolutely. We can push back and forth and like still come out friends. Yes. Um, and I also know this is not a very Portland way of relating. <laughs> <laughs> where folks are so passive. Facts. Facts. <laughs> and they want to ghost you out. Um, so I just I just want to thank you for being willing to like call out and give the opportunity to hear truth when you hear truth and that you speak your truth when you've got that truth. And I love in that the the big thing in, in that underlies all of that is like this opportunity for redemption. Yes. Right. You want to speak a little bit about that? The opportunity for redemption? Yeah. Well, like, I mean, you know, letting people speak what they have to speak. Because I bet in HR, you must hear that a lot. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but here's the thing, Janelle. Who's perfect? Yeah. It, it, it's like we expect for others to be perfect, but to give us grace. Mm -hmm. Right? I demand grace for myself, but I don't want to see your imperfections and give you any grace when you make mistakes. And that, that's one of the biggest issues before us right now, in my opinion, especially what's happening in the workplace. Individual contributors are stepping into their power, mm -hmm. which I celebrate, right? And then they're becoming laser focused on the, the errors, the, the problems that exist within leadership, mm -hmm. leadership across the board. And they're being really critical. Leadership, they're human, right? Yeah, just yeah. like the individual contributor is human, just like the entrepreneur is human, just like the elected official, it's human. But folks are becoming less open to forgiving a person for making a mistake, especially when they own the mistake and then say, I'm committed to doing better. 
Now we just need to hold it to him. And so I'm seeing that happen a lot in the world where we're just not extending grace. We're just not very nice to one another. And even when a mistake happens, we hold on to that, to that gripe. We hold on to that mistake in perpetuity, right? Like we just, we keep those people there and, and we, we, you know, look down on them, but then we demand that people allow us, the individual who is casting opinion and being really critical of someone else. They're saying, well, I'm a human and you, you know, you need to give me grace. You need to, you know, give me an opportunity to learn and to live and to grow because that's what's fair. That's what's inclusive, et cetera. It goes both ways. And so yeah. when you're talking about the honesty that you're looking for and the grace that you're looking for, what I appreciate about our relationship is that we are honest with one another. Mm -hmm. The higher up you get, the less feedback you get. Yeah, it's so true. Right? Yeah. You get yeah. feedback all the time when you are, you know, kind of in the middle or on the lower end, when you're a younger professional. But when you become a successful CEO like Janelle, mm -hmm. right, when you own a company, when you have some success, when you become the VP, the chief, whatever, the, the elected official, people stop giving you feedback. They don't stop having an opinion and criti <laughs> critique, but they Amen. stop giving you the feedback so that you can actually grow and evolve. And it's usually based on fear. And so you have to have a fearlessness to the to true relationships of being able to give that information to them so that they can become better and your relationship can get deeper. God, I love that. Thank you. Uh, it's so true because anymore as, you know, as leaders of our company, there is no plan quarterly mm -hmm. review for, for my role. That's right. And, I mean, honestly, I don't want to hear it. Not really. <laughs> Not really. But if you mess up, you want to hear it. If you, you hurt do. somebody, you want to yeah. hear it. I just yeah. don't need a quarterly, you know, summary of, like, just come holler at me. Yeah. You know? Please. Well, I think, you know, a, a real example of this we were in a women's group together mm -hmm. and I remember I had been kind of holding on to we had like a member who was always late and missed lots of <laughs> meetings and then I kind of like let her have it and it, and it was it was unfair now and I look back at it and you just turned to me and you're like that is not sisterhood that is not cool like the first time she did it you should have told her right on. and then the next time and and why do it here in a group setting you had pulled her aside and said I, I you know I have an issue with this. I let that get in the way of a very valuable relationship. And I, and I regret that. And I, I so thank you for, for calling me out in that moment because I didn't know what I was doing. But it's a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. I know, I know you, I know the kindness of your heart. I know the, the integrity of your spirit. So when you respond, Re reacted in that way. What is it telling me? You've been harboring this for a long time, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's been it's been just kind of like grading at you for quite some time, and then it happened again, and you're like, first of all, I mean, we <laughs> we all have those moments, <laughs> but it's not kind to the other person. Mm -mm. It's not. No, 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 and it did not serve me. No, and it, and I wouldn't want it to mm. happen to you from someone else. Yeah, I would be like, yo, 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 not not you know, pause. First of all, first of all. Let's all stand up in the room right now because we're about to, it's about to be energy in this room <laughs> in a negative way. But ultimately, it's all the same. I just want people to, to all have the same opportunity to heal, to get feedback, and to do better. I Like I said earlier, like get, being direct in communication is not, I'm from Portland, that is not something <laughs> that, that in my life I've experienced very often. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness there's all sorts of beautiful people moving here from all over mm -hmm. to teach us how to say what is on our minds. That's right. Um, and you moved out here from Michigan. How did you get to, I mean, ha Portland, like Michigan to Portland? Like what brought you here? Man. So uh, my mother, her name is uh, Cyrilda as well. So she's big Cyrilda. I'm little Cyrilda. We have the mm -hmm. exact same name until I got married. I'm going to tell you how my mom gets into this story, but just yeah. big surreal to context, right? I have always been very goals oriented, right? From a very young child, you know, uh, I was an entrepreneur when I was eight and my brother was five. We mm -hmm. raked people's yards in the neighborhood because I saw that there was a need and I had a need for money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the hustle has always been in me. And that just comes from being in a low income environment. I grew up in the crack epidemic in Michigan in an all black environment that was incredibly low income. So that's my background. The only way to get out of that background, the, that environment was education. Mm -hmm. I knew that my parents 
told me that. My grandparents told me that the neighborhood, they put a lot into me to get education because they knew that once you have education, no one can ever take it from you. Yeah. So I go and I become a biologist, right? I'm going to be a biology teacher because my biology teacher changed my life, right? I'm good at math and science. I'm going to become a biologist. I become a biologist. I become a teacher. I figure out, love kids, don't, don't, don't like parents. Adults are cool. <laughs> parents are awful, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I got to get out of here. But along the way, I had been tutoring in math and calc and physics and different science courses, predominantly students of color and non-traditional age folks. And I was like, this job is dope. And I'm working at Taco Bell. I'm tutoring on the side. Like, I got all these hustles that's going on just so I can pay my rent. And um, and I asked my manager, who the tutoring manager, I say, hey, how can I do this for the rest of my life? Like, how can I be you? And she tells me, you have to go to school, get a master's degree in education, da da da, da. I'm like, done, right? So then the, I start to research, who's at the top of higher education? Like, how do I get to the top? Yeah. Now, I, people in my life, they work in factories and foundries, right? Yeah. In quick service, Walmarts, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I'm like, I, I don't have a template at home, which is fine, right? But I know I want to get to the top. I just need a, a blueprint of how it how to get to the top. So I was going to become a dean of students. Dean of students means that you have to basically, to be competitive, you have to work in all the revenue generating functions of higher education. Athletics, housing, admissions, right? Um, Financial aid, anything that has money coming into the school, you have to become gifted in those areas, right? And then you can be competitive. And that's basically what brought me to Oregon. I worked for Michigan State in the athletic department doing financial aid. Like, I literally just made a checklist of all the places I needed to work. I worked at Ball State in admissions. I worked in every area of higher education except for housing. That was my next stop. I, I got a job at Reed College in Southeast Portland. I was a dean of housing there oh, for I years. I can't imagine the culture shock of coming from Michigan girl, to Reed College. Girl, girl, <laughs> <laughs> I so I tell Big Cyrilda, I'm like, okay, Ma, I'm going to Oregon. I'm taking my talents <laughs> to Oregon, right? Yeah. And she said, where? And I said, Oregon. She says, Oregon Trail, Oregon, right? <laughs> yeah. And I said, <laughs> don't get dysentery. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that's all we know about Oregon. Is Oregon. So I came to Oregon to pursue my career to become a dean of students at a university anywhere in America. I didn't care where I went. I just had this goal. Reed College gives me a job working in housing. I'd never worked in a private liberal arts, highly selected environment. And Reed College changed my life, changed my fundamental life. Education can only give you so much, Janelle. Yeah. Right. Culture is different than education. I got to be around rich people who took trips in the wintertime to south of Spain. Yeah. People would say, where are you going for the winter break? In all my life, I never expected people to say, oh, I'll be in France. Oh, I'll be in Spain. Oh, I'll be... I'm like, what? what? Mm-hmm. Let me Google how much it costs to get there. I didn't have a passport at this time, right? Yeah, right. I didn't even know where to get a passport. I was like, <laughs> how do I get to Spain? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I learned about vino. I'm from Michigan, I, from the projects of Michigan. I drink Bud Light and drive Fords. Yeah, right. right. They're they're telling me about vino. I had to Google what is a vino. Mm-hmm. Right? They didn't call it wine. <laughs> yeah. Why can't we call it wine? Yeah, right. Like, oh, why are you trying oh, to keep I'll this take a secret? A, a vino, a rich, robust. I'm like, <laughs> what is? A... So, Ray College taught me about money and wealth and how wealthy people sit down at the table and put a napkin on their laps. Mm -hmm. You don't learn about that in college. Yeah. There's no no bio course or chemistry Mm -hmm. course or physics course that teaches you that when you sit down immediately, you put the... And then I got all these forks and spoons in front of me. I'm like, oh my God. So Reed College taught me how to be sophisticated in a way for me to become, to to run now a multi-million dollar HR firm. Because in the absence of that acculturation, I wouldn't be able to go into these rooms with the power brokers who can get me a million dollar contract, right? Yeah. I, yeah. They would they would not interface with a person from my environment. They just wouldn't. And so although Reed was very culturally challenging in every way you can possibly imagine, Janelle, uh, and every I cried every day. I remember what I, I remember just asking people, hey, just just point me in the direction of black people. I don't care if they're impoverished or very wealthy. Um, I just like to just see a couple, please. Yeah. Do you know any? And they were like, mm, what would those be? Well, do we, do we have an MLK? I go to the, I'm like, yes. <laughs> Rosa Parks, MLK. Yes. I will <laughs> always find black people at a Rosa Parks and MLK. Kind of here. 
<laughs> yeah. It was not like a Philadelphia or Detroit MLK. <laughs> I remember that you had told me like when you go, you go all over the city to speak and promote your book and right work with different clients. And I remember that you had told me, and it allied on for me as a white girl, you were like, when I go to a new city, I I definitely check out their MLK. Immediately. Yeah, because that lets me know what's going on here. Immediately. Number one, I'm going to see what kind of weave they got, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I want the new yakky. I'm going to see what kind of skin treatments, like, oh, they got some new microderm. Let me Google this, right? See if I can get it in Portland. Because they speak to, they're going to create products and services that are specific and germane to my needs. Portland was missing that in some pretty, still is, in some pretty significant ways. You know, I remember when it used to be called Grand Avenue, Mm -hmm. switched to the name, and the talk around me as a child of like, oh, why are we changing the name? And that's confusing, <laughs> right. and and you know, and I I thought, oh, they're they're you know, that's great. The it's a better name than Grand Avenue, and that seems like great to celebrate a, an amazing leader from history. Right. But it wasn't until hearing your story of like, but that's where I go immediately. Yeah, that I was like, oh, this th- it creates place. It does. It creates place. I can find my people anywhere in America. Yeah. Quite frankly, the world. Because where there's an MLK, they're going to put black people and black stuff usually in that vicinity. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. Facts. Facts. So you were in Portland, you're at Reed College, putting your fancy napkin on your lap, (laughs) drinking vino. Right. And then, you know, fast forward and you want to... You know, we we were friends by by then, and I remember you took that job as the head of HR for the city of Portland. Right on. And I remember you being very clear about knowing that women of color don't historically last there very long. Mm -hmm. And it it struck me that, like, okay, so she she's brave. She's going to somewhere she knows she knows it's going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge, and it didn't stop you. And do you have a feeling of why, before you got the job, that was an issue? And then did your opinion change as you were there? No, my opinion most certainly did not change (laughs) while I was there. I think that most of these big organizations in Oregon and Portland generally are not designed for Black people to thrive. And I knew that when I took the job. I wouldn't say that I was brave. I would say I was ambitious. Remember, I am a paint by numbers ambitious person. You Meaning, were working the plan, right? I was wor- you make the plan, you work the plan. You work That's the plan. That's my motto yeah. in life. So when I did the career change to get out of higher education and to go into business, and I go to grad school, get my MBA, focus in on human resources, which was a switch from finance. You know, I'm a math and science person. Yeah. So I'm like, finance is where I'm going to go. They make good money. It's going to be great. And then I fall in love with with human resources. My goal became to get into human resources and then look to the top. Who's at the top? How do I get to the top? What's their resume look like? And how do I emulate, you know, model their resume to get to the top? And so I literally made a plan of where it is I needed to go so that I could get to the top. And I had identified the city of Portland as the top. It was strategic. It was, it was, you know, it was ambitious. Yeah. And when I Googled, leaders in HR Oregon, right? Like, just like simple. And I found, I find Yvonne Deckard. Mm -hmm. She's the chief human resources officer at the city of Portland. She's running a bureau of a hundred plus people. And I'm like, that's the job. Mm -hmm. How can I become competitive to be able to get that job? So then I get offered that job, right? I go into HR. I don't even like, man, I interview hundreds of places for an HR job. I go in through the window. Like, and by window, I mean the basement window to get (laughs) access into human resources. And I just started hustling to figure out, you know, how to move, to be competitive, to become the head of human resources at the city of Portland or an equivalent job in the world. Right. I get the job. I'm paying attention along the way. Janelle. Yeah. I'm paying attention to who survives in these big executive positions. I'm paying attention to who gets access to these positions. I'm paying attention to how many black people have gotten access to any leadership positions mm-hmm. in any corporations or government organizations in uh, throughout the, the city. Because this is where I am. It's where my babies are. It's where my husband is. I'm paying attention to all these things. And I'm like, I get it. 
Mm-hmm. They'll put us into these positions. They'll put us in usually when they're in disrepair. Right. You clean up the mess. Come in there, you clean up the mess, but then you become, and you got to ruffle some feathers to get things back on track. You got to get out mm-hmm. the people who have been problematic. You got to promote the people who have been underserved but have genius inside of them. You got to change up systems that have led to these bad outcomes. You got to do all these things that pisses people off who've had power, mm-hmm. right? Um, and dominion for so long. Mm-hmm. Got it. I get it. I'm going to come in there and make these make these changes, but I have to be surgical. I've got to get in and I've got to get out because when they put black and brown people in these positions, they sniper shoot them at the end. Mm. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. I'm not confused by it. You, we can look at, you know, testimony after testimony, leader after leader, college president after college president, elected leader after elected leader. That's what happens to them. So I'm like, done. I'm, I'm brave only because and through my ambition. I want the job. Yeah. I'm going to get that job. Yeah. Right? To get you where you want to go. Precisely. Come hell yeah. or high water. This is how I got out of the projects to where I am. You've got to be, you've got to have ambition and you've got to be, have moxie to go for it. It is so punk rock. Like, I always say, like, punk rock taught me, like, no one is going to invite you to the table. You got to just, you got to take your seat. You, or stand on the table and break through it. Or bring my, I'm dragging my table, my, my chair yeah. behind me. <laughs> right? Okay, can mm-hmm. you scoot over some? Let me get in right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, what's interesting about your experience to me at the at the city is that you work for Ted Wheeler. I did. You did. Who I often, man, I don't hear anything but criticism I of, know. of this man. And I will say the most of the criticism, honestly, that I hear of him has nothing to do with his role mm-hmm. or the actual city government. Most folks don't know it's the county that's accountable for much of the homelessness, health care, community justice, the courts. But, you know, you've shared with me that you you respected him, that you liked working with him. What would you want to share with Portlanders about him? Because I feel like he's become, you know, fair or not fair. I don't know, a target for a lot of this. Right on. So, number one, it's not that I respected him. I still respect that man. Mm hmm. Being the mayor of the city of Portland is a thankless job, Mm. right? It's Mm -hmm. incredibly, all the elected official positions are uh, incredibly thankless most of the time, but especially the mayor because you become the face of the entire city. People think that the city of Portland manages Portland public schools. Like people, people literally have no idea what the city of Portland does, but they definitely think that it is the county providing social services support when it's not. It's the infrastructure of the city. It's water. It's, you know, land use. It's permits. It's policing. It's, you know, it's those kinds of things which intersect with the human experience, right? But they're not responsible for that. So when it comes to Mayor Wheeler, what I appreciate about Mayor Wheeler that most people probably will never be able to experience is that he genuinely cares. Mm. He genuinely wants to do well. He genuinely wants the human experience to be positive. If he finds out about stuff being messed up, he is going to activate. Right. He is going to at his heart of hearts. And this isn't a person that I text and talk to all the time. We're not BFFs by any stretch of the imagination. But I've I've seen the integrity of that man having to make hard calls and hard decisions that will impact the human experience on behalf of the voters, of the residents, of the people throughout the community who have very divergent perspectives. Right. And when one person gets what they want, when one group, right, gets what they want, another group feels that they're not getting what they want. And they're angry at the face of the city, even though he likely didn't make the decision that that got to that outcome. It's not fair. It never will be fair. If you get into leadership because you're looking to be celebrated and praised and you're looking for fairness, uh, you shouldn't Mm. be a leader. Right. But but (laughs) but I know him. So I'm not confused about the kind of man he is and the kind of leader that he is and the righteousness that that he carries when he is making these very hard, polarizing decisions uh, at a time when the city is struggling tremendously. You've been a huge champion in my life for standing in my power and success. Preach. Like, like own it. Own it. Own it. And— it, whether it was me celebrating when I got a new car. I remember that. Oh, yeah. You were, you were like, that's a pretty that's a pretty nice looking whip you got yourself. Like, and <laughs> No, 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 Janelle. If you recall, you were considering not getting it. I know. That's when we talked. And yeah. I'm like, be pleased. Mm-hmm. Like, that was the conversation. 
I couldn't believe it. You worked so hard. You built something that didn't exist. I'm well, sorry. I mean, it's it is Portland, and I feel like there's pressure a lot of time to tone it down. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to say, "Oh, listen, if we lived in another city, I would." There's a lot of things I would I might do <laughs> that I don't do here. But you know, just this week when we were at the Women of Influence, I offhandedly said to you, "Oh, wow, this is my you know my tenth tenth uh, anniversary of this award. What could I have possibly been?" doing 10 years ago to be a woman of influence, you know, and you, without hesitation, you were like, because we've been both working hard for years. And that's why we're still here. In those moments, I'm just, I, it, it stops me. And I'm like, what? you know, again, catching me, calling me out on like, why am I having these thoughts? Like, you're right. Success is not all of a sudden. Hmm. And giving me permission to give myself uh, some credit and, and like, oh, yeah, well, maybe you've been badass a long time. Maybe you maybe this isn't just a fluke. And and in that, I love that you also are recognizing like we've worked alongside each other. Like I see you, you know, and I see you and it's easy for me to do for others. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's so hard for me to do for myself. You know, my question for you, like, where do you think that confidence comes from? That like there's no hesitation for you in those moments of like, yeah, own your power, own your success. You know, where does it come from? It just I think it comes. It's just always who I've been. Hmm. I I want to be successful. Mm-hmm. And I recognize how much work it takes to get there. The journey. Right. I recognize that I was pumping while driving, going to Salem to work as the human resources director because that was my first HRD job. And I can't become the CHRO unless I'm the HRD. Mm. I'm pumping while driving. I started my first day in the job the day I gave birth to my daughter. Yeah. Right? So it was a partial day. Yeah. <laughs> and then three months later, two and a half months later, I'm on the road pumping while driving. I know women who are working in Salem during uh, when the session's going and they have to go and change their feminine products, right? Okay. And they don't have a... Pl- they're like, I got to drink less water because I don't have time to go to the bathroom and then I got to get right back into Portland. It takes me now almost two hours to drive home in traffic. Like, you, these are the decisions you're having to make. Yeah. These are not healthy decisions for you. It's like, your body's not like, yeah, less water, please. Less healthy food. Yeah. yeah. Right? They're not saying... Right? So we're making these sacrifices... And I'm watching people not celebrate the journey, not celebrate the sacrifices that were made. Well, I'm going to celebrate my sacrifice. I, I am aware of my sacrifices. Mm-hmm. I'm aware that this didn't happen overnight. I'm aware that I made the plan and I worked the plan. And I don't know one woman. I don't know one person, quite frankly, but I especially don't know one woman, one mom who didn't work her A off Amen. to get to where she got. So every time I hear someone like, I don't know how, I'm shit, I know how. Hard I know how you got there. Work. Hard Hard work work. every day making the decision not to dial it in, not to phone it in, not to tap out, not to say there's an easier way. But every single day saying, I'm going to show up again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to get two hours of sleep and I'm going to do it again. I I was speaking at an entrepreneurial conference and the the idea of design and why it was important to have diversity when you're talking about – designing a new building, a new, in it was, they were actually, we were discussing the Olympic Mills building. And I was like, the Olympic Mills building has these bathrooms mm-hmm. where you have to come out and wash your hands mm-hmm. with the men. Mm. Well, I'm pretty sure that only men worked on that project because I can tell you if I've just changed my menstrual cup right. and I've got blood on my hands, I do not want to come out and have a chance encounter with one of the men working in the building. And I was shamed for saying that. People complained about me as a speaker Mm -hmm. for speaking up about that, Mm -hmm. as if my body and what it needs to do and me being a woman should be shut down. Girl, Mm. oh, we should do just a session Mm. on how Mm. the needs of women, the unique, specific needs of women are being ridiculed and made to seem as though they are not real 
and they are not different and unique and special and important, and that our needs associated with those differences should just be generalized. Look, I'm all about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Yeah. But within that, there are some unique things that people need. And just because my perspective on this is different from yours and it's different from the popular con- you know, concept that's out there and it's, and it's not what you think it should be based on what you've seen on social media, does that mean that you get to try to shame me and make me feel like a bad person because our views aren't aligned? I don't think so. And, what, and what's happening right now is that if you, if you do not 100% agree with the dominant kind of progressive ideology that's out there, now, now you are being shamed and people feel like they can take shots at you because it's too much of a dominant culture perspective that's, that's existed for so long. And my thing is the, the work that we've been doing with diversity, equity, and inclusion is to say that all the perspectives require equal presence and weight. I'm not going to shut, I can't shut down your perspective because it's not mine and you can't shut down mine because it's not as popular yeah. as yours is right now. Yeah. And that is something that we, that's the grace, right? Like that's the, yeah. the, the openness to conversation and and dialogue and debate that is missing. Yeah. But I totally agree with you. We need to have an entire conversation just about what is going on in the world where if you give a perspective about a menstrual cycle uh, and you don't say like, well, the menstrual cycle perspective is valuable and those who don't have a menstrual cycle have a different experience. But but, but women who do have a, or people who do have a, a menstrual cycle, the needs that they have need to be recognized and discussed and, and taken into design conversations and policy conversations for you to be anti-trans, anti You know, it, it's like they'll tell you, you know, they'll name you that. It's really disconcerting to me. It's a reversal of where it is we just came from. Remember? Yeah. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you were coming in with a with a, you know, non-binary trans, you know, even LGBTQ generally broadly perspective, you were on the outs and they discounted it and they shut it down and they said there was no place for it. And now we have swung the pendulum to the other side that if you are not specifically talking about that community's issues and making sure that they're at the forefront of the conversation, then you don't have a place at this table. Your perspective about that particular niche group in this case women who have menstrual cycles, right? Or yeah. w- women who were, you know, born um, as female and continue to identify as female. If you're coming with that perspective and you want to give that perspective, there's no place for that here. And it's happening more and more. And that's not inclusion. So I was sharing with you some years ago that I wanted to recruit more agents um, from the Asian community. Right on. More real estate brokers from that community. And as someone who had lived and studied in Southeast Asia, I I considered that uh, my second home. You know, I was sitting around surprised. I feel silly about it now. I hadn't made much progress. And I remember that you said to me, well, I can tell you what the problem is, but you're not going to like the answer. (laughs) <laughs> As you what had, I say? <laughs> you said you got to go out and make some more friends in that community. Absolutely. And you're right. And it's really changed my lens on what actual action being in action around creating diversity looks like. And I and, you know, it's not that I didn't like the answer, but I can see why you said that because it was like, well, this means you're actually going to have to do some work. You're not going to go back and tell your, you know, my marketing team, all right, let's get some pictures of more people from Asia. Like it was like, no, you got to go out and you have to be vulnerable and, you you know, you've got to go out there and make connections, make friendships, show up, care. And I risk the vulnerability and feeling like, like, oh, you know, my, revealing my former self right now because I feel like a lot of white women like myself are totally missing the boat on that core idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what this work is about. And I watched this during the Black Lives Matter movement where white women formed circles with themselves to talk about other mm-hmm. white women and what they weren't doing and calling them out. Mm. And putting more space between one another, you know, really the actual work that needed to be done. So, you know, when in fact the work is the simplest 
and yet the hardest thing to do Mm -hmm. is show up and build those relationships. And, you know, it's vulnerable, it's time consuming, and there's no shortcut to that. What's been frustrating to me, maybe you can just, I'm coming to you now as like my HR director. (laughs) Thank you. What's frustrating to me is that like, I am losing people as I talk to people, as we're recruiting people, and they're like, oh, I'm going to go over to this other company because I'm just so excited about the the DEI work they're doing. And I look at that company, and I'm like, well, that they're it's owned by a white man. They have little to no diversity. I'm sorry. W- what is the work that you're doing? That's right. So They put it on their website twice. It, yeah, yeah, and just— so you know it's like it's like it, I struggle with like it, you know in my own organization it, people were like are we going to do you know at the beginning of Black Lives Matter are we going to are we going to have something on Instagram mm-hmm. and it's like I don't I don't know cuz that to me it does not it does not matter what we have like I don't matter about the performative but what I do know is we have a lot of folks here mm-hmm. that we need to care for and right. we need to show up and ask if they're okay I don't know, you know, like maybe I'm asking you, how do I not be annoyed? How do I not get frustrated? How do I, how do I provide leadership for mm-hmm. those around me yeah. and encourage those around me to like see the diversity that we have and make sure that we're supporting those folks? What can we do to, to move the agenda yeah. forward on, you know, inclusion and having diversity? It's how I'm taking your your question. Yeah. What's really interesting about the observation you made about the white women, you know, kind of critiquing other white women is is that it's happening everywhere. Right. Yeah. It, w- the conversation and the calling folks out. Let's just start with the first group by white folks to begin mm-hmm. with is antithetical to all things diversity, equity and inclusion. Right. Calling each other out isn't changing the actual material standing that the most marginalized folks are having inside your ecosystem, inside your your workplace. So I'm seeing mostly white uh, or very homogenous environments talk about diversity ad nauseum, point fingers at each other and blame each other, right? Shut down conversations to get power uh, over one another, right? But the material experience and opportunity that historically underrepresented and marginalized people are having inside that environment is the exact same as it was. Mm-hmm. But they're talking about it all the time, so it makes it feel it makes it feel like or seem like conceptually like they're doing the work. They're doing the work. No, the the work is changing the socioeconomic status of those who have been disproportionately put at the bottom. Capitalism in the United States is going to continue to exist my entire lifetime. Mm-hmm. While I'm, I'm here on <laughs> Earth, it is not going to change into something. I don't believe it. Not mm-hmm. for a moment. Okay. My issue with capitalism is that black people, people like me and my children, are disproportionately represented at the bottom, the workers, the grunt workers, the non-owners mm-hmm. of this of this this structure. When we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and Black Lives Matter, we're talking about the structural systems that exist that that keep those folks in that environment, from the prison pipeline pipeline and the prison industrial complex to the education system and who gets to go to Lincoln School on the West Side? It looks like the University of Manhattan yeah, no. um, versus the, the ones that still have lead in the buildings to, you know, all of these kinds of things. Who gets the opportunity to get into an HR job, right? Lord knows I applied 100 times. It was not in supposed to be for me to have this opportunity. Why are we making it so hard for people who are ambitious, people who are smart, people who are educated to get these access points? Why is the system still rigged against people being able to be promoted into leadership positions? Why is it so hard for these boards to be diversified? Because there are executives of color who are brilliant and genius who would create systemic change inside these ecosystems. It's by design. And the fact that we are pretending to be dedicated so that we can get the gold award for diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? By using the right words and booing the right people when they make a comment that we don't like, because that's the that's that's what DEI is, mm-hmm. right? Someone talks about a menstrual cycle, say, boo, that's not relevant. That is the opposite of where we are today with the thinking. Mm-hmm. That person, who probably was not a person of color, has put them, patted themselves on the back and said, now that is what diversity, equity, and inclusion is all about. I was an ally in that moment, and I'm changing the system. That is not the change that people who are historically underrepresented and marginalized are looking for, period. Mm. We want access. We want opportunity. We want the contracts. 
right? Why can't we not get million dollar contracts? I got my biggest contract came forward and it was a black woman who saw the contract inside the organization. And she says, I've never seen, she, she worked there for quite some time. She says, I've never seen a black owner, a black business person get a contract like this. I'm like, well, are, is it, you know, is it rare? Do you not give out contracts of this nature? She was like, no, no, no. She's in procurement. She was like, no, no, no. We give out these contracts every week. We give out contracts at this size or greater every week. I've just never seen a black person, a black owner get one like this. That is the kind of change, the systemic change mm. that people are trying to see. So as far as what progress looks like, I think we need to start having more conversations about the effectiveness of these calling out and allyship um, crusades <laughs> that white folks are on because yeah. it, it keeps me material, materially at the same exact place I was in 1962. Yeah. Get out of here. It really frustrates me. So we have got to start have, calling people in, not calling people out, calling people in to say, I love your passion about this topic. How are we going to get more people leadership jobs inside your organization? I want to invite you into a conversation to talk about that, right? Yes. Or how can we make sure that your pay equity, fun fact, I'm going to give you a little bit of information yeah, on this. this. Please. Fun fact. Pay equity in the state of Oregon, right? We're one of a couple states that did pay equity. I worked at the state when legislation was being built. I worked at the city when the legislation was was put forward and activated. People needed to get into compliance with pay equity, meaning that, um, you know, you can't pay two, the same two people for doing the same work less than the other person, right? Yeah. The concept behind it was that women make... Seven, white women make 70 cents on a white male's dollar for doing the exact same work. So doctor to doctor, phlebotomist to phlebotomist, leaf blower to leaf blower. Mm-hmm. Okay. Black women doing the exact same work make 62 cents on that white male's dollar for doing the exact same work. And Latina uh, ladies, they are making 52 cents on that white male's dollar. Like we know mm-hmm. these numbers and they are real. I, I work in compensation and human yeah. resources. We have access to what everybody makes. This is the reason I got an HR mostly because I'm nosy. Let's yeah, be right? very clear. Let's be very clear. <laughs> so when you actually go and you disaggregate the data, you can actually see that. It's like every place, every big organization I've worked at, when you did this classification by classification, divide by by gender, you would see that the white guys were making significantly more than the women. And I'm like, HR, all women, mostly women. Yeah. Why are we not doing this analysis and then going and making these recommendations? That's DEI. That's change. Okay. Yeah, it's change. Now, we do pay equity with that in mind. That was the origin and the spirit by which the pay equity legislation was established. We got to get pay equity across genders. But it was written in such a way that when the shifts happened and we had to go through and make sure that there were bona fide factors, that's the language, bona fide factors that would make it so that Janelle makes less money than Cyrilda. If we are doing the exact same job and exact same classification, it needs to be based on the amount of years that you've been doing the work versus I've been doing the work, the amount of education you have in the job, the performance increases. Those are the kinds of things that will justify if we're doing the same work, me making more money than you. When we go through, we do these analysis. When when this first happened, and and I'm in a room with a bunch of HR ladies. I think there was one guy in the room talking about this. Dozens of us. We see that when we start to actually right size things to be in compliance with the pay equity uh, rules, it was mostly men who got the increase in the compensation. How? No one knows this. This is this is. Fun fact, yeah. <laughs> because people in, in Salem are not tracking the actual data associated with this, right? They're not saying, now show me who got the increases and who didn't get the increases and let's make some modifications to the legislation. That's not what happened. So because it's based on bona fide factors, you know, men were coming and saying, like, Jimmy makes $10 more than me. Jimmy shouldn't. Men were the people who went forward and made the complaints because most of it, most people kind of looked did a global review, but then allowed people to come and make a case of why they feel like their money was less than someone else's. But even even when the system, we were just kind of just right sizing how people were getting selected. When folks were giving women more compensation coming in, like the work that's happened over the past like eight, nine years yeah. where folks were like, oh, you know, we're going to give this woman, even though she's got less years experience than Jimmy. We're actually going to bring her in and pay her, you know, significantly more than than we would have historically. Now, when we look at the numbers, Jimmy's like, well, hey, hey, I've been at this job for 20 years. She's been here for two. I got 30 years of experience. She has 10. She's got a master's degree, but the master's degree is not a bona fide factor where she should be able to get paid that much more. So based on this and the years of experience, I believe I should be making more money than she is. And they're like, per this legislation, you're right. So now we're going to bump Jimmy above her, even though the system was trying to right-size itself. 
women are starting to advocate more for their compensation, their, their salaries, right? Yeah. They're saying like they're more aware of the money, they're more aware of the markets, and they're saying, I know my value and how hard I'm going to work in this job. So they're making counter offers. So I offer you $200,000. You say, uh, actually, I'm here at, you know, Lehman Brothers and I'm making two twenty dollars right now. So I need to come, for me to come to Portland, I need to make two fifty. dollars and they're like, per pay equity, we actually can't give you two fifty because then that means I got to to increase Jimmy's salary to to two fifty as well based on the pay equity work. So either a they need to take less money, or b they don't come here at all because of the restrictions it's placing on minority, highly coveted talent that's in the market where they're they have positions that are of comparable nature inside the organization. And so these are just some of the unintended consequences that are actually keeping women's wages and equity, in my opinion, suppressed because we're just now starting to get access to these jobs. We're just now starting to get access to the ability to negotiate these wages. So we don't have the years of experience of some of these guys in the in these environments. But that bona fide factor is arbitrarily manufacturing us to be at a lower level. And that's just not punk rock. No, it is not. <laughs> and then if you can get over all of those hurdles Come on. and you are a person of color who moves to Portland... Then you've got to navigate a world hmm. where everybody feels a little uncomfortable around you, man, because they're not used to having friends. Like you go back to here, you got to make some friends that are black or from other cultures. Or I was hearing Nina Bird talk a few weeks ago, and she was like, "Listen, just just put yourself out there, be awkward, make some friends. Every person knows that you, that you're not comfortable." Like, right. your body language is telling us all we need to know. Yep. But get over, you know, get over your embarrassment, your shame, and, like, make some relationships. Because we have this kind of, you know, brain drain of people. Like, we get them here, and then they leave. Absolutely. There was a, uh, a research project that happened years ago, but I think it's still pretty accurate today. Someone refreshed it recently. Imported minority, racially minority talent, right? So black and Latinos in particular mm -hmm. stay in Portland three years or less. I think it's like 80% of the imported black and Latino talent stay in Portland three years or less. What are we? We're the, Portland is the widest metropolitan city in the United States of America, right? I feel like that's a, a it's data a, point. It's that's a data thing. point. I think, though, that that data point, it becomes an excuse. It just becomes an excuse. I remember uh, your husband Charles and I were friends before you, you and I, and he mm -hmm. was always like, you're going to love my wife. And I'm like, why did you hold out on me for so long? <laughs> um, but I remember him, you know, they, so we were having, I was having these conversations with people in EO, and I'm like, well, I mean, we would if we could. There's just no people of color to hire. And, yeah. you know, and he was like, that is the thing that drives me craziest about Portland is that people that, like, People just refused to see the community here. You're absolutely right. There are two things that happen, though. You know, I'm an HR person. I'm a recruiter. So, number one, people don't want the indigenous black population that's here. People who were born and raised in Portland are in the, le the least represented people of color in any leadership positions in the state of Oregon. Overlooked. People feel like, oh, it's too much baggage, too much history. They just, they don't get the opportunities. And mm. that is a rigged system in and of itself. Number two, what what tends to happen is, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. This whole concept of the whitest metropolitan city uh, in the United States of America, it fuels us to make certain decisions and justify, you know, certain, certain challenges and obstacles. It's like, well, we are the most white place in, in America, but we're sustaining that. We're sustaining it with public policy. We're sustaining it with, mm -hmm. you know, like going out in Portland. When I got here, I was 25. I was single, ready to mingle, you know, trying to get <laughs> out here in these streets. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to bars and clubs in Portland. There were no bars and clubs in Portland that played, you know, hip hop music, that paid, mm -hmm. played R&B. Irrespective of the people who are in the club, if you play black music, black people will come. And I remember talking to one of the bouncers, a black guy who was a bouncer. And I went to a bar by myself, you know, just kind of getting out and about. And I'm like, yo, what is up with the music in Portland? Yeah. And he said, well, they don't want black people to come. Like, that's a, that, they don't want black people to come because they see black people as violent, gun violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, interesting. If there's no social outlet in community, why would we stay here? There's just no space for us here. And so it's by design. Portland wants to keep itself the whitest metropolitan city in America. Because if they if they didn't, they would invite us. They would have our cultural outlets be present. 
it's incredibly hard for black folks to get liquor licenses in, in Portland. They can't get it. Why can't they have all these policies and rules? Why can't they say, if you're putting a, putting forward a culturally competent bar because we want for this place to be a truly yeah, inclusive right. environment and have social outlets for, for historically underrepresented folks, for people of color, for Latinos, for Russians, for Asians, where their community is here and they can party and be vibrant in, in and of themselves. Why don't we create policies to allow them to, to be able to get liquor licenses? Because they it's very hard to get. And there are very few places that have an actual liquor license of color in the state of Oregon. Why don't we allow these small businesses to be able to get these kind of uh, loans to be able to get access to the vacant buildings in downtown Portland and, and bring the community and vibrancy? We have an opportunity right now. Yeah. But the system is designed to sustain itself. If we want it to be different, the system would change. We don't want to be different. We want to talk about being different. Yeah. We want to preach and pontificate about how woke and how liberal and how ally oriented we are. But we're not willing to make material changes in these systems that are designed to keep certain people out and other people up. I love what you're saying just about like, creating, creating spaces for community. It is real. Yeah. And it's a loss for everyone. It's a loss for everyone, but it is especially a loss for all the talent who comes here and they're looking for a place to just find other people, to find likeness, and they cannot find it. It has been a sacrifice, a social sacrifice for me to be here. I have had enormous success professionally. I have grinded it out. I've put my head down. But socially, where I can see other black women with afros and swag and I can be influenced by like how she matched the this with the that, with the jacket, with the guff, with the ah! Doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I've got to go all the way to the East Coast, the Midwest, or the South. I can't find that at home. That is a sacrifice to be in a space where your likeness is not celebrated. Yeah. Here at all. I remember you coming home from a trip. I think you were in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys came over for dinner. And my first question to you was like, how amazing was it just to see other black folks? Man. Because I, I mean, I know that feeling you get in a room. I, the room for me, that room was when I came to Portland and I volunteered at the Rock and Roll Camp for Girls. Mm-hmm. And it's the first time I'd ever been a, in a room where every single person in there was a woman and a musician. And like, there's no words for it. Right. They're just they're, it, the feeling, though, of like, oh, and the beauty that comes from it. Oh, to be known, man, to be known. So imagine being 16 years in a city where you never have that yeah. feeling unless you manufacture it in your home yourself. There's no organic pop up, show up, you know, like, oh, if you go here, you'll be able to find it. There's no registration sign. It's very it's very challenging. And it and it and you have to go and fill your cup up. You can't just always work. It, it's not enough. No. And you can't always just be with your babies. Right. No. And your husband. You need to just you need to, to fully bloom. And just, you know, blossom in an environment. The sun feels like people who are different from you, but similar. And it makes you just feel electrified. It's joy. Find that joy. Joy punk. (laughs) I know there are so many organizations here in Portland, the state of Oregon, nationally. I know you do this work all across America that want to diversify their, their workplace. They want to create more equity, more inclusion. How do they find you? How can they work with you and your team? Tell us tell us where to go. Right on. Well, number one, LinkedIn is my area where I put a lot of content and I spend a lot of time. So I'm all I look, it's my only social media that I check. And so if you go to Workplace Change on LinkedIn or to Cyrilda Summers McGee on LinkedIn, you'll find me there. Also, we're on Instagram, but I pay less attention there. My my team manages that. But you can also go to our website. We put a lot of content on our website. We have a lot of both written content and videos, and that is workplacechanges.com. So we hope to see you around. And, and we do really believe in the work that we do. <laughs> and so it's if we can work. help, we want to help. Your videos are awesome. Thank you. I love those. I know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being here and having fun in the conversation today. Really appreciate you. I love you, Janelle. I love you too. I hope you know that. And I don't say it the way that people say it in passing. No, like, I know. I've got major love for you and your daughters and your 
you're now your husband. Mm-hmm. Whether he knows it or not, he's family. Mm-hmm. I don't oh. know him as well, but you know. He's got a man crush on your man. <laughs> right on. It's a vibe over here. It is a vibe. So no, I love you so much. I love what, what you stand for and I love what you represent. And I love that you do it loudly. And I love that you do it with integrity because there are a whole lot of loud people that are fake. And you mm-hmm. are not one of those folks. And I appreciate that mm-hmm. in more ways than you can probably imagine. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Cyrilda Summers McGee for sharing her humor, friendship, and human resource wisdom. Join me next time, where I'll be chatting with punk rocker, author, and musician, Seth Lorenzi. We talk about generational trauma, psychedelics, and the early DC punk scene, among other things. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you. We at the show have noticed an uptick in listens in the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Ukraine. We're not sure who you are, but thank you for listening. Enjoy and gratitude, Janelle.